So welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where you are. Um, welcome to our seminar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christina Lester Bandera and I'm a professor of politics at the University of Leeds in the UK, but more importantly for this purpose, I'm chair of IPEN, the International Parliament Engagement Network. And um, IPEN is a network that brings together parliamentarians and academics to discuss issues of, of public engagement. And we also now co-host the new global public engagement hub with the IPU, the Interparliamentary Union. And so this seminar is part of those activities that we do together with the IPU to host, co-host the public engagement hub. And we, we've put this series on to um, follow up the publication of the Global Parliamentary Report on Public Engagement last year. If you don't know that report, so do go online to find out about it. And since then, we've put seminars on, on lots of very wide range of topics from education, how parliaments to education, to how to involve citizens on legislation, to today on future generations. So we have covered a little bit all areas of public engagement. Um, before I introduce today's topic, um, actually Tamar very helpfully has put the link to that global parliamentary report on public engagement, if anyone wants to see, it's in the chat. Um, so before I introduce our topic and our speakers today, just a few housekeeping uh, rules. Um, the seminar is being translated into from Spanish and French. So if you want to hear the seminar in those languages, please head down to the symbol of the globe, which you can see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you click on it, you'll be able to see that you can choose which language you want to hear the seminar, English, Spanish or French. And throughout the seminar, I would ask you to keep your mics muted unless obviously you are asked to, to speak. But please do keep your cameras on. It's really lovely to see people. And as I'll explain in a minute, this is not going to be a seminar by PowerPoint, it's going to be a conversation. So it's even more important to see people's faces. Um, and, um, and I think that's it in terms of the, of the rules of what we after in the seminar. So today's topic, I'm really excited about introducing today's topic on future generations. Because in, in, in some ways it goes to, towards science, science fiction type of thinking. You know, well, how do we include, how do we engage people who are not even born? How do we engage people who were born, say, in a hundred years time? And it was following, uh, listening to Didier to talk about, talking about this uh, back in June in Stockholm that I thought I'd love to bring this topic to, to IPEN and to the Public Engagement Hub. Uh, to discuss about how can we think about this, what, you know, thinking about future generations, what does it do about our processes now, the way we do policy making now, but also the way we engage with people now in terms of the consequences of those future generations, whether it's the generations already born, whether the generations still to be born. So that's what we're going to discuss in here. And We've got two excellent speakers to talk about this. So we've got Didier Calouverts, and I'm sorry because I always feel I say your name completely wrong, uh, who's Associate Professor at, of Political Science at the Free University in Brussels. And his research and teaching deals exactly with democratic innovations, polarization, but also future generations. And you'll see there is so much linkage between all of those different areas. And then really pleased to also welcome Dan, Dan Velmerson, who's a PhD researcher in political science at the same university and who's doing PhD research in this area, which is, to me, is always the most exciting thing. PhD students always have the most novel ideas and, and thinking, um, not to disregard your DDA, but I think that's the excitement of doing a PhD, which I did like a long time ago, too long. Um, so Dan's research is very much dealing with democratic short termism, so thinking about decisions in the short term rather than long term and the representation of future generations. And the format we're going to have for this seminar is not going to be a PowerPoint presentation, it's going to be an in-conversation session. So we thought of a number of, of questions that might be useful to explore. And so that's how we're going to do it. So I'm going to ask questions to Didier and to Dan and then going to answer. 
And at any point, please, if anyone comes wants to come in and also put a question besides the questions I'm putting, just click on uh, raise your hand or put in your chat in the chat and hopefully I'll pick it up in the chat. Um, likewise, you'll see that, um, so we're organizing the, the discussion across two different blocks. The first block, the first 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to be talking about the concept itself, what we mean by engaging democratic um, future generations, sorry, what does that mean, the dem democracy, myopia and all of those things. And then the second part, the second block is going to be more about practical things. What can parliaments do to actually embed these concepts, which might seem quite abstract? In that second part in particular, I would really, we'd really welcome any questions or any examples from parliaments represented here or things that you are already doing or things that you think may be problematic that you're doing and you'd like to any views from Didier and Dan. Um, so at any point just put any comments or questions in the chat um, or click on um, raise your hand if you want to come in. We do want to keep this as organic and fluid as possible. Okay, is everything that's okay for everyone? I see some heads nodding, so I'll move on. So let's get started from the beginning. It's always a good start to begin, <laughs> way to begin. Um, and I'll start with you, Didier, if that's okay. So in, in recent years, the concept of future generations has, has gained, gained increasing traction. Uh, both in political debates, but in the media, the media increasingly is talking about this. And in part, actually, it's because of climate change, for instance, debates, that sort of debates, sort of the policy, the types of policies have ra risen, haven't they, in, in our um, narratives in the, in the media. But can you tell us a little bit more about why policymakers themselves should be more reflexive about uh, pos posterity in their work? You know, why should they think about in what they do in terms of the future generations, a future that they might find very difficult to connect to because it's it's not here. Didier, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for having us. Um, that is a really interesting question. Um, and I think it deserves a bit of nuance in the sense that um, thinking about the long-term impact and thinking about the relationship between the policies we make today and their implications for uh, future generations as such is not new, of course. I mean, policy scholars, um, policy makers have been dealing with these issues for, for decades, but you are absolutely right in uh, pointing out that something has changed over the last couple of years. Um, and I think two tendencies or two trends might be uh, discernible. Um, on the one hand, I think that there is a growing sense of urgency that we need to more actively consider future generations in today's policies. Um, policy makers seem to be increasingly aware of the, let's say, the, the transgenerational impact of their decisions, even though, of course, not all policy makers act upon this. Um, and I, th I think it might be due, it might have been prompted by societal events such as like the youth for climate protests or the, the COVID pandemic, um, but also by, by increasing attention from international organizations. On the other hand, I also see a shift in the scope, let's say, of uh, policymakers. Traditionally, um, when, when people were on policymakers and policy scholars, but we're, we're talking about future generations, they were mostly debating climate change policies because that is a type of policy that is by definition intergenerational. But I, I, I've seen in recent years that the scope has broadened quite significantly. And it's just not about, not just about climate change policies anymore, but it's also about migration policies, about budgetary policies, about education policies, even decentralization policies. All of these types of policies, um, or there is a growing awareness that all these policies are increasingly intergenerational. So the willingness to think about posterity, uh, the willingness to think about future generations is growing, but it's also important to act upon these, um, uh, upon future generations and their concerns. Um, I think for three important reasons, um, and that's basically what your question was about, like, why is it important to think about the future? Well, first of all, I think many governments have su subscribed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as such, there is an international imperative to take the future seriously. If you're serious about your international commitments, then you should also be serious about 
incorporating the future, future generations and so on into the policy that you develop. I think secondly, um, and for me, that might be the most important reason is that this is an issue of legitimacy. Um, governments and parliaments should have what we call the all affected principle in mind when dis making decisions. And that's, it sounds very fancy, but it basically means that everyone who is affected by a policy or is affected by the consequences of a policy should be involved in the process leading up to that decision. We don't want people to make decisions for us or to make decisions that affect us without us being involved somehow. And increasingly, future generations have to bear the consequences of the policy that we make today, so we should keep them in mind when making those policies. And then finally, I think um, a final reason why we should be very reflexive about, um, about future generations and, and their role in, in current policy debates is that there is an issue of intergenerational justice. We as people, as current day generations, as policymakers, have an obligation and we have a moral obligation to think not just about how to distribute goods and resources within current generations, but also how to distribute them between past, current and future generations. We owe it to some extent to future generations, our children, grandchildren and so on, um, to give their needs proper consideration. So I think, I mean, there is growing traction, there is a growing debate, um, it's, it is gaining um, attention in the media and in policy debates, but I think there are three main reasons why policymakers should be reflexive about uh, about these issues. Thank you very much, Tiki. Um, I've put in, in the chat um, the, the way you define all affected principle, and I'll put in there also about intergeneration uh, justice in a, in a minute, once I, once I, I can. Um, and just before we move on, I forgot to say at the beginning, if you could, if you have a chance at some point to rename yourself to put the country where you're dialing in or the country that you feel you correspond to, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you. I'll do the same because mine doesn't say the country I'm in. And so, so that shows really clearly very good reasons why it's become much more prominent, not just in terms of uh, academic debates, but well beyond that in terms of, um, in terms of, um, the media debates also and policy makes are sort of picking up on that. So and most people can see, you know, why they, I think most people would agree with that, that we, we have those, you know, like intergeneration justice principles, but also intuitively, most people can see how that really is a problematic thing to do if we think of social media. I mean, it's not even the tomorrow, it's the immediate, you know, how people reply to things. It's we very much our politics or societies are very much the politics or in the science of the now and even sometimes of yesterday, rather, let alone tomorrow, let alone in, in years to come. Um, so I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to turn to Dan now, whether you could reflect a little bit more closely on that problem. You know, what is the problem exactly and how do, why do democratic decision making and future generations seem almost like antithetical, so contradicting in itself and um, in, in what, yeah, if you can give us just a reflection on that to unpack okay. a little bit more. Yes, of course. Um, yes, as as the has just said, there is this uh, increasing awareness that that our gen that our decisions today have an impact on on future generations, and indeed not only on on climate change, but on on different sorts of policies. But at the same time, we also notice that our democracies, or the way that we organize our representative democracies today, uh, fail to sufficiently take into account the future. Um, and this is what we call the the democratic myopia thesis or democratic short-sightedness or democratic short-termism and there's this idea that that democracies inherently have some mechanisms that force us to consider mainly the now mainly the present and fail to take into account future uh the future or the interests of future generations and i believe this is uh, visible on on two levels. Firstly, the le on the level of the decisions or of the the policy output that these democracies produce, meaning that decision makers, um, when when making decisions, um, make uh, or or um, are mainly uh, focused on on producing policies that are beneficial for the present generations and not for future generations. On the other hand, and relatedly to that, I think this dem democratic myopia also is visible. On the um, in the processes or the democratic processes that lead to those uh, outputs themselves uh, as well, 
because future generations do not um, or, or are not as represented as the current generations when, when making these policies or when, when considering different policy outputs. Um, so this is the the idea of democratic myopia. Um, but this and this is a, an important note to make. This is not uh, this is not to say that autocracies do better than democracies. Um, quite the contrary. Oftentimes democracies um, fare better in in reproducing uh, future oriented policies than than autocracies. But what this does mean is that there are in uh, the representative democracies as we see them today, there are some mechanisms that indeed forces to look at the present instead of the future or that um, causes to uh, insufficiently take into account the uh, interests of future generations. Thank you. Sorry, my mouse was misbehaving then. I wasn't letting me unmute myself. Thank you. That's very clear in terms of where the problem is and, and um, how it sort of might go against the, the principles of of democracy. I wonder, Didier, if you can extend a little bit more on that um, in terms of what the research shows. Does the research actually support this? Is there evidence to support that democracies are myopic in particular? And of course, there's another side to it, isn't there? Because people, MPs, deputies, representatives, however you want to call them, they are elected by people. So obviously they feel that connection to be to be accountable to those who vote for them now, and that might encourage that short termism. Uh, so we can explore a little bit later how maybe institutional approaches might go against that, but it's a reality that it's there, isn't it? Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit more what research has found in terms of how different democracies deal with this. Okay, so um, the good thing is that um, um, academic efforts to study um, democratic short-termism and the mechanism that Dan explained um, uh, uh, earlier, um, research on this is growing all over the world and results pour in basically every day. Um, so Dan and I have done some research on this, um, but many other people are actually working on this. Um, and I think the first thing that we focused on is um, examining to what extent democracies actually take into account these future generations' concerns, their, their demands, their needs, and so on. Um, and in a paper that's going to be published, I think, in the next couple of uh, uh, weeks, um, we first determined um, whether all democracies are actually equally short-termist by comparing the policies of 36 countries um, on, the, on what we call the Intergenerational Justice Index. It, it sounds very fancy, but basically it means that um, we compared um, countries in terms of how they deal with um, uh, family policies, climate efforts, retirement policies, budgetary policies, um, R&D investments, and so on. We compared the countries, um, we created like a composite index or one indicator that says how long-term um, thinking are or how forward-thinking are democracies. And what our, demo what our analysis has shown is um, that democracies and all democracies in our data sets actually favor short-term policies over long-term ones. So they're more concerned with their immediate voters, their immediate current, current day voters, than with future generations and the long-term. And all of the countries in the data sets do indeed have a bias for the short-term. But importantly, and I think that is one of the interesting findings, is that not all democracies are equally short-termist. Not all democracies are equally long, um, um, equally myopic. Um, and we see a, a huge difference between what we call like consensus democracies and majoritarian democracies. Uh, consensus democracies are democracies that are uh, characterized by large, oversized coalition governments, proportional representation, multi-party systems, federalism, and so on. And these types of democracies that are generally very inclusive actually outperform majoritarian democracies in producing long-term policies. So majoritarian democracies are, um, the UK is an example of a majoritarian democracy. So one party governments, first past post electoral systems, uh, two party systems, um, centralization of power at one level. So what, what the, the data show us is something very important, like the more inclusive a country's democracy is of different groups, different interests in society, the more long-term policy, uh, the more able it is to produce long-term policies. So inclusive democracies are generally also more long-termist or less myopic. So that's what we have been looking at in terms of policies, in terms of what policies have been produced, but we've also been looking at the process of making, um, of making policies, of the process of representation. 
And that's also what Christina referred to, like what are po policymakers, what are members of parliament doing? So um, we have studied the extent to which future generations are actually referred to in parliamentary debates. Um, so the extent to which future generations are represented in parliaments. And to be honest, this is a study that we did based on the Belgian federal parliaments. But what we have found is that future generations and long-term perspectives are not, the, of course, the primary concern of members of parliament, by far, not even close. Um, we studied how often MPs refer to future generations in parliamentary documents, and we found that there were actually very, very, very few references, um, and usually very strategic references and poorly justified references to future generations. Um, just to give you a number that is very striking, um, future generations we found in the Belgian parliament are the object of representation in less than 0.5% of all parliamentary documents, of all parliamentary activity. But we do see fluctuations over time. And what was interesting based on that study is that, um, that elected members of parliament do refer to future generations, but they do so less often in election years. So when you're a member of parliament standing for election and you have to convince current state voters that you're the one to vote for, you don't think about or you think less about these future generations um, than in off election years. So they focus, MPs focus primarily on ones that can vote today rather than on future generations that might be able to vote within the next 50 or 100 years. So bits of a, of a mixed bag, unfortunately. Um, it's not all good news. Um, it's not the primary concern of, uh, of, of members of parliament. Yeah, I mean, that intuitively, it's what uh, you'd expect, isn't it? And on that study, I know we are also going to look at what the UK Parliament does on that, aren't we? Which I'm really looking forward to that, to see any contrasts with, with Belgium, but also to test out that consensus and majoritarian democracies. It'll be interesting to see what's happening there. And so I wonder if we can talk a little bit more about that, the voter. Uh, the voter perspective with you, Dan. So we've seen what future generations, thinking about future generations involve, why, how does this fit with democracy? What does research show at the moment in terms of how different types of democracies are dealing with this? Can we explore a little bit now the causes for this? So why is it that there's this um, uh, sort of irresponsiveness from democracies to future generations? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, there are, there are um, a number of, of factors that contribute to this um, democratic short-termism or to this democratic my myopia, as, as we've called it. Um, and it's um, I, I will highlight three of them. And the first is the general idea that people in general, uh, uh, everyone amongst us, is, is, more, is more occupied with the near term than the future. Um, we tend to discount the future. We tend to place more weight on near-term benefits than on future benefits. We tend to um, postpone costs toward the future. We tend to uh, minimize future challenges, and we tend to overestimate our capacity to overcome those challenges. So inherently in, in the human mind, there are these biases towards the short term. Um, now, uh, evidently, this makes it hard for politicians, uh, even good willing politicians who want to represent future generations to make policies for the long term, because uh, politicians who, who stand for re-election are incentivized to focus mainly on the needs of, of, of current generations. It does not make sense for a politician who wants to get re-elected to incur uh, severe costs on, 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 um, on present day generations in order to secure benefits for future generations. Politicians like that probably won't get uh, re-elected. So that, that makes it hard for politicians to, to, um, to, to focus on, on the long term, even good willing politicians. Um, a second, um, a second reason why democracies are um, or are uh, more um, uh, or, or are irresponsive to the needs of future generations is the idea of uh, policy reversal or, or short electoral cycles. And we mentioned uh, earlier that there are differences between these majoritarian democ democ democracies and these consensus democracies. This is, uh, I believe, more apparent for um, or more applicable to uh, majoritarian democracies. And that is, uh, of course, democracies are associated with these peaceful transitions of power. Uh, every few years we have these elections and a new government can come to power and can uh, choose the policies uh, that, that correspond with, uh, with the wishes of the people, um, or with the wishes of, of the people. 
now of course if um if government uh changes it is hard for for governments also or for countries to pursue long-term objectives because these these um policies that may or, or that are focused on the long term and that may take a long time to mature they um can be reversed or can be overturned when a new government comes to power so um of course this is this is more apparent as i explained uh, or, or as i said earlier in majoritarian democracies where you have um one party governments that that quickly change it could be that this is less the case in consensus democracies where you have these uh coalition agreements uh between parties and where um it's 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 very rare for for all government parties to to um to become opposition parties uh in the next election uh, and a third reason of course is um and this is very uh, very important the absence of of future generations um both as electors and as elected representatives uh, future generations cannot represent themselves uh, future generations have no way of, of focalizing their interests. We can even say that uh, since they are not yet born, they do not have interests, of course, but uh, and someday in the future, future generations will exist and they probably will have some interests, uh, but, but there's no way of knowing what these interests will be. They will probably be also quite diverse. There are differences between uh, generations on, on what their interests can be. So I think there it is the case, but that while, while current generations are shouting for everything, future generations remain silent or or are, are whispering towards us. So I, those are the three reasons I believe that that uh, that we are very responsive indeed to to the needs of future generations. Thanks so much, Dan. And in case you haven't noticed yet, we have put, put been putting some of these specific terms and key arguments in the chat. So if you haven't picked up it all, it's, it's the key terms should be all in the chat. And also, in case you haven't noticed yet, we have people here from literally all over the world calling from Trinidad and Tobago, Alison there from Brazil, uh, Yulia from Ukraine. You're so welcome, Yulia. Um, we've got also um, people from South Africa and obviously from a few people from a few places also in Europe. If you haven't put the, the country where you're in yet, uh, you can rename yourself to to put the country and that's really nice just to get a feel for where you're coming from uh, while you're speaking there then i was thinking then does is that an argument then for something like the house of lords in the uk so the house of lords is not elected and it's all nominated it's all people who should have the long-term view and um do you have any views on that or sort of is that it you know, should we all have a House of Laws? What's the problem with that? Before, I know we have other things to move on, but I just wanted quick thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, it could be that if indeed we have we have few elections or less less elections than we have now, we are able to to focus more on the on the long term. But I think that we yeah. come again to this to this idea of of, of uh, autocracies do do not do better than than democracy. No, exactly. And and, and that that's something. Uh, I also uh, so it could be that 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 this that these longer electoral cycles uh, help our democracies to move forward or, or to, yeah. to take the interests of future generations more into concern. But it also poses a giant risk of of being becoming detached from the people. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right now yeah. and. And democracy itself is a good worth passing on to for future generations. So yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But it's an interesting one, isn't it? Is to think about the role of, of chambers like that one. And but also, as you said, you know, elections are great, but also if you have constantly elections, you're always thinking election term. And you see that, for instance, in the US, it, there's constantly elections, there's always an election um around the corner so it's probably about more conciliating different types of institutions isn't it and in the case of the uk that the house of Lords lo looks more at long-term issues the house of commons more short-term issues that sort of thing and um, so let's start now the, the sort of the second block of of the seminar where we're going to look at more at solutions and practical experiences so dan and dj have outlined really well to us what the issues are how to think about future generations in terms of democracies what the problems are so now we're going to look at um some possible solutions or ways to address this and um and basically what can we do about this and, and obviously looking at the our virtual room today we have people from all over the place and if you want to bring in any ideas of any practices or something that you already do or that you know about or you want to ask a question clarification by all means come in and just um, raise click on raise your hand or put it in the chat and i'll bring you in but to get us started on that 
Um, I'm going to ask Didier and then for some specific ideas. So Didier, let's start with you. Um, what do you think we can do about this? You know, what sort of specific solutions, initiatives can parliaments in particular have in this area to, to engage with future generations? Well, that's, um, that's a beautiful question, but it's also probably one of the most difficult questions. Um, but before I answer it, um, there, there is one thing we need to get straight from, uh, from the start, and that is um, many solutions to democratic short-termism have been launched in recent years or over the recent, uh, recent decades, um, but most of them are actually currently mostly, um, let, let's say, theoretical solutions. Um, so if your parliament or the parliament that you work for or are a member of has not yet adopted these solutions, be aware that very few parliaments have actually done so. So that's a cautionary note from the, from the start. Um, the second thing that I should mention is that we should make a distinction between um, overlapping and non-overlapping generations. Um, it's, it's very important to think of generations as future generations as two very distinct groups because the solutions for both are actually quite, quite dissimilar. So overlapping generations are generations that live at the same time. So it's like parents and their children or grandparents and their grandchildren. And the fact that they live at the same time means that you can also ask them what they want. You can ask them what their interests are and what their demands are and what, what their needs are. So these children, uh, these, these, um, these youngsters, they are citizens. They are already citizens. They have very concrete and very materialized interests. But they are currently excluded from voting and for, from running for office. And at least until they have reached a certain age, age they, they are not able to express their opinions and their preferences in a, um, in a, in a very democratic manner. And in, I mean, they can still make their voices heard through protesting and so on, but democratically within a representative system, it's very difficult for them to make their, uh, their voices heard. A different situation arises when we're talking about non-overlapping generations. That means generations that are um, temporally separated, um, that do not coexist at the same time. So it's our generation and then um, our offspring in, let's say, the next 100 years or the next 500 years. We cannot know what these people want. We cannot know what their interests are because we cannot cognitively grapple what's, what they might reasonably want um, and so on. Um, and there might be huge differences between generations as well. I mean, what would be good for our grand, grand, uh, great-grandchildren in the next 100 years might be bad for the, the generations to come in the next 500 years. So it's, it's always a bit difficult, but I'm going to propose some solutions for the overlapping generations. So generations that live at the same time. Um, and the first solution that has often been proposed, and, and many of you, you will probably know it's already, that is lowering the voting age. Give the right to vote to people under the age of 18 or 21. And we see that historically democracies have, have evolved in this way. We see a gradual lowering of the age, uh, a voting age from, let's say, 25 to 18. In some countries at the moment, it's even 16. But some authors are arguing that that doesn't go far enough, that we should lower the age of the voting age to 12, to 10, one or some people even say to six. Um, we should give people at six the right to vote. Um, and there are counter arguments evidently. Uh, children are too dependent and um, on their parents and are too influenceable and so on. But to be honest, that's also applicable to many of the people who can vote nowadays. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that is a very convincing argument, but we can discuss what, how low we should go with, uh, with the voting age. Another solution that has been proposed is, um, is the opposite. It's instead of um, uh, giving people the, the right to vote at a lower age, taking away the right to vote from older people. If we think, um, and that's generally how intergenerational relations are portrayed, if we think that there is a diametrically opposed relationship between the interests of old people and the interests of young people, we can and, um, give, give young people the right to vote, or we can take away the right to vote from older people. We can silence the old and give um, the young a voice. Um, I don't think that that has been put into practice in any country, and there I are, wonder, of course... I wonder why did you... <laughs> 
it's they are a very, fairly large group, the old, uh, the old ones. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, but it, it is a solution that has theoretically been uh, been proposed. I think a third solution that has been proposed is um, youth quotas. So ensuring that there is a representation, a minimal representation or a proportional representation of young people on electoral lists by reserving spots for people below a certain age. So you make sure that there are young candidates on electoral lists, you make sure that they are in prominent places. And as such, you assume that they might get elected and as such, you assume that their interests might get um, represented in, uh, in parliaments. Um, and youth quotas have actually been implemented in several countries around the world and usually with, with great success. So this is one solution that has actually been put into, uh, into, into practice. Um, another potential solution is reserved seats. That goes one step further. Instead of making sure that there are a, a proportional number of young people on electoral lists, what you're saying in the case of reserved seat is that you ensure the representation representation of young people by allocating a reserved number of seats in Parliament for people below a certain age to make sure that they are by definition represented and you kind of bypass the electoral system. These people, these seats have to be taken in Parliament in any event by people below um, a certain age. And then maybe a final solution. Um, once again, it's more of a theoretical solution, but it's, it's an interesting one because it has been debated in several countries. And that is um, the mini votes. Um, and there are many variations to the idea, but the essence is that parents are actually proxy voters for their children. So if you are a parent, you get one additional vote and you get one vote to vote in your own interest, but you the other one to vote in the interest of your children. So you act as a proxy, a representative of your children. Of course, I don't know to what extent we can expect uh, parents to vote differently with using the two vo votes, and I'm not entirely sure that um, uh, parents will necessarily make the reflection that the vote for them is not necessarily a good vote for their children, but at least it has been suggested. Um, so I think for overlapping generations that coexist, we can include them using several like institutional mechanisms. Thank you, Didier. And this, this of course, also um, things that a lot of parliaments are doing already in terms of engaging with young people, isn't there? So like um, youth parliaments or just other mechanisms. Now, in our last um, IPEN IPU seminar, we heard from New Zealand the sort of edu education initiatives they have. And the very interesting thing they have is a youth reference group whereby young people advise the speaker on how the parliament should engage with young people. So there's some really interesting innovative practices. Um, there's lots of parliaments that have youth parliaments. Uh, my favourite one so far, unless someone else here in this call tells me of a better example, but the, my favourite one is the Welsh Parliament because the Welsh Youth Parliament, they elected for two years mandate and they actually work on specific two to three policies with, with the members of the Parliament and consult with young people. So there's all sorts, there's all sorts of in between ways of dealing with this in terms of youth engagement, isn't there? And again, an encouragement. Anyone who comes wants to come in with any examples or any questions, please do. And um, Dan, can you say a little bit about then specific ways? And I know that you're going to say sort of first overall in terms of the type of solutions, and then we can talk about specific examples. Um, before we, we do that, though, Colleen wanted to come in. So is that okay if I just hear Colleen first and then I'll pass on to you, Dan? Is that okay? Colleen. Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you, Colleen. You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. How frustrating. Oh, what a shame. No. Yeah, if you type it, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, so Dan, yes, can you give us a bit of a, a, a feel for how, how can you use practical solutions for those generations that have not yet been born, which I think is fascinating. Uh, yes, it is very fascinating, and that's also more my area of expertise. These unborn generations, um, and there have been have been um, different innovations have been proposed already. 
Um, I will highlight four of them, uh, or four innovations. Um, now, these innovations, of course, they can. I, I will give the general idea behind these innovations because, of course, they can change in their modalities or their powers or their place within the democratic system. Uh, but it's just to give an overview of, of what kind of ideas are out there. Uh, and the first idea is to have uh, some sort of designated uh, members of parliament or people who, or members of parliament, representatives, who get uh, specifically tasked with representing the interests of future generations when, when talking about certain policy uh, issues, etc. Um, now, how these are elected, uh, etc., or, or how much... Uh, uh, members of parliament should be designated as a representative of future generations that can be discussed. But uh, there is this idea of, of having uh, these special um, uh, these special MPs or these special representatives for future generations. Uh, uh, just uh, it, it looks a bit like these Dimini votes, also in the sense that uh, this is uh, largely theoretical. Uh, I don't I'm not aware of any examples where where these uh, where there are designated uh, representatives for future generations. Uh, another idea that has been put in practice, and I think this is the most popular one, is to have special committees for future generations. Uh, some parliaments indeed do have these um, special committees where uh, either general issues can be discussed or specific issues like sustainable development, technology and innovation, or just a general committee where, where um, a, 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 any policy issue can be discussed. Um, now, again, these can have legislative powers or they uh, can uh, have merely uh, be a place for, for deliberation about uh, what, what the interests of future generations can be. Uh, but so second uh, possible innovations, uh, special parliamentary committees for future generations. A uh, third option is to have um, uh, independent commissioners for future generations. Um, so these are um, uh, you know, these these uh, commissioners exist outside of parliament in the sense that uh, they are often not elected, but they are uh, um, kind of. Uh, proved to be some sort of counterbalance against the electoral uh, arguments that I highlighted earlier. So they are they are independent from election from elections. They are independent from Parliament, and in that sense, uh, by that capacity, they can inform Parliament on on uh, on on certain issues of future generations. Um, Again, their powers can change, but uh, so this idea of, of having a, a separate or independent commissioner who can advise Parliament and, and MPs uh, in the policy uh, making process. Uh, and then a, a last um, innovation that I want to highlight are uh, manifestos for the future. These can also take different forms, but uh, one example of, of this is um, governments that are required to produce um, uh, reports on future issues once every electoral term or when a certain policy gets voted or when a certain law is made that uh, governments or parliaments have to provide some sort of impact statement stating how this decision will impact future generations or how future generations can be affected by the decision that that is being made these are all um, these four issues or these four innovations are all designed to incorporate these these um, the interests of future generations within the decision making uh, which is uh, as, as mentioned in the beginning uh, uh, a goal of or or a possible solution towards this uh, democratic uh, myopia yeah. mm -hmm. and all all great examples um before i ask you to give us specific examples of of those types of initiatives because i know some of them have been implemented i'll just read colleen's message um because the sound wasn't working so hi everyone and the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago hosted the Commonwealth Youth Parliament debate in November last year. And what we noticed is that the young people are very passionate about issues that will affect them in the future. One in particular is climate change. And I think we've seen that elsewhere. Uh, the representative from Tonga gave an excellent speech which made, which made international news. Our parliament is also hosting live panels discussions with youth representatives regarding budgeting, governance, etc. So there's, there's quite a few initiatives, I think, in this area. And I think parliaments are realising how useful they are to actually listen to young people about specific topics. And um, Alice uh, Phoenix from the UK Parliament also refers to that sometimes this may not happen within the Parliament, but within the government department. So she refers to the Department for uh, Digital Cultural Media and Sport, which has a youth policy development group. 
I think one of the questions sometimes with this type of initiatives that we may have as academics might be about who is participating in those. And, and there is quite a bit of research showing that sometimes these initiatives are great and they produce a lot, but they might be limited in terms of the type of people involved in those groups. So that's another thing to, to bear in mind. Um, but yes, Dan, if you could give us some examples, specific examples of those initiatives, because I know there's quite a few, um, quite a few Palmas already actually implemented some of those. Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, they are less frequent than um, than innovations designed to include the young, but uh, also the unborn have, have received uh, increasing attention over the last years. Um, as I said earlier, to my knowledge, I, there, I don't have any examples of designated uh, MPs or designated uh, members of parliament, but the others, for the other uh, um, innovations, there have been examples. Now, uh, first, I have to tell you that um, my research, or, or I'm, I'm mostly aware on, uh, of, of uh, innovations in Europe, but please, if, if you know any other examples, please, uh, please share them. Uh, I would be very interested to read them. Uh, but especially the parliamentary future committees, those are, I think, most um, most uh, uh, most most prevalent. Um, I think uh, these parliamentary committees exist in Finland, in Chile, in Brazil, Iceland, the Philippines, Lithuania, and Uruguay. I'm not very sure about the specifics of of all these different uh, committees or how they work. Um, but but these are so these have uh, especially. I think most of them are also quite recent. Uh, and they they have been um, they have I've, I've seen daylight in the, in the last uh, six years or so. Uh, so these are very recent, but these are very interesting examples of of these parliamentary um, futures um, of these parliamentary committees for future generations. And um, shall I give the floor to Olin? Yes, please. Yes, Olin, if you if you want to come in and. Sh share your experience or questions that'd be great thank you we're all about sharing then <laughs> sure thing uh sorry dan i did i'm i'm not intending to cut you off i, I just wanted to um uh, react after you finished uh sharing what you were saying it's very interesting thank you uh for the research and thank you for also uh sharing all of this with us it's, it's always as christina said um uh, you uh being the experts on on intergenerational justice, it's really interesting to hear your latest uh, finds. So just quickly introducing myself, my name is Oline perez -Rinault. I work at the OECD Public Governance Directorate, particularly in the Youth and Intergenerational Justice Unit. Um, so just uh, in, in terms of examples, I'm very interested to hear a little bit more about what you have developed. Um, to contribute, the OECD has developed uh, an intergenerational justice framework to uh, conceptualize uh, the, way, the, the uh, dimensions in which governments can incorporate uh, future generations' needs into their governance processes and decision making. So we have, for instance, political le leadership, which you have discussed, Dan, setting a strategic, uh, so at the highest le levels of government, ensuring the political leaders are take, looking after the needs of future generations, setting a strategic vision through uh, strategies and plans, accountability and oversight institutions, such as the ones that you've discussed, uh, generation of commissioners, and I, I believe you mentioned the future generations commissioners of Wales, um, anticipatory and adaptive tools, so uh, age-sensitive uh, budgeting, for instance, and the GBA plus analysis in Canada, and age diversity in public life and decision making. So, I mean, we've we've published all of this and, and performed research, uh, which is all captured into our latest report uh, entitled Fit for All Generations. I'm happy to share that in a link. Um, and this was published uh, 2019, and that was our research. So I'd be really interested to hear across all these dimensions. I, I know that today's discussion is much more focused on age diversity in public life and decision making. Um, but yes, it's very interesting to hear your, your work on especially having uh, those accountability and oversight institutions come into play. Another thing that I thought would be interesting to contribute, our research found that the more or positive relationship between uh, the older um, cabinet, uh, cabinet, average cabinet age uh, was in countries, the higher the spending in, for instance, pensions rather than education was. So very interested to hear as well your findings in that sort of regard so that we can come in and not just uh, with an argument, oh, it's good to listen to the needs of future generations, but also uh, why is this so important and, and you know, what are the 
to tangible effects of this in terms of international justice. If you have uh, quantitative data on that, it would be interesting to hear it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan. If you could share this, the, the link to that report, that would be really appreciated. Um, and it's great to see um, so much activity in OECD exactly in this area too. Um, Dan, did you want to mention any more examples? I don't think you had mentioned an example of Wales, had you? Which, which is an example no. of an independent commissioner. Do you want to say a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, that's that's a very interesting one indeed. Uh, as as Olin said, there Wales has an, an independent uh, commissioner for future generations, who is yeah. actually a quite um, or that's quite an interesting development. I think he um, it was established in two thousand sixteen. Uh, the Welsh commissioner um, and and uh, um, the commissioner Sophie Howe, I think her name is. Uh, has the uh, ability to, or or she can uh, advise governmental bodies and, and public administration um, to set goals for future generations. And she advises these these governmental bodies on on how to uh, set goals for for the future, etc. So that's a very interesting example, indeed. This uh, Welsh Commissioner uh, for Future Generations. We also have the uh, Hungarian Commissioner. Um, so that's another example. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure he had um, quite some extensive powers in the past, uh, but now now these these powers uh, are are a bit um, diminished. Uh, and also Israel had had one had a commissioner for future generations, but unfortunately uh, that commissioner has also been abolished. So uh, for commissioners, I know indeed of two examples: Wales and Hungary. Uh, for now. Uh, and manifestos of the future, I believe there will be quite a lot uh, of those, but uh, I think uh, the most prevalent example is Finland. Um, again, uh, Finland, where the government indeed has to uh, publish every electoral term a report on a specific issue concerning future generations or concerning the future. Uh, and its parliamentary committee um, for the future then can uh, react to that um, to that uh, to that manifesto or to that government report on the future and can can uh, share its concerns etc so that's a very interesting example also how you see that that different uh, institutions can can um, can coexist and can can enforce each other yeah thank you and we're nearly running out of time which is a real shame because now all the questions are coming in um let me see how we deal with that. Um, this Madeleine Ashcam is asking whether there's a particular um, model solution that is recommended. And, and I think I think that is such a complex issue because there's so many things to consider. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and Didier reinforced in the chat, anything that involves youth engagement, you have to think about how you're selecting those people. And one of the major pitfalls of any youth engagement initiatives is that it's those kids who are already engaged in politics who get involved. So one of the reasons why I like the, the Welsh Youth Parliament is because some of their members are elected by others, so they're already involved in politics, but men, but a portion of the members are actually elected, nominated by local community organisations. And often those community organisations are from areas like, you know, addiction areas where young people would not be involved in politics. So that's a major thing to do, to, to think about in youth policy, but also how it links with parliamentary business. Um, and I'll put a question from Alex Reed, if that's okay. There's more questions in the chat, Didier and Dan. So if you if you don't mind then answering those, but Alex will finish with us because we're running out of time, unfortunately. So Alex Reed is asking, um, actually, Alex, it's just on the screen. So do you want to ask it rather than just being me? Yeah, thanks a lot, Christina, and thanks Didier and Dan for, for a really interesting discussion. So I'm a parliamentary strengthening specialist and I've worked with IPU and UNDP and, and other organizations. So. Um, I'm always thinking about how parliaments can collaborate and work together on some of these issues that um, will be critical for future generations. And, and I think particularly around fast changing uh, technology and, and so on and how that impacts democracy in parliament. So I think working across jurisdictions and building international solidarity and understanding on these issues is going to be really critical. And I was I saw last year the Finnish Committee for the Future held a conference with other committees. And I just wondered if in your research you come across any other examples where parliaments can share information together and collaborate. Did you, do you want to answer that just quickly? Um, just very quickly. Um, 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 there are um, apparently these annual conferences um, between, um, um, before the, 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 the seminar started, we had a brief discussion uh, with the people from the IPU who mentioned that 
apparently the next conference is going to be in Uruguay, um, where all parliaments that are dealing with or that have these like future con, uh, committees or future generations committees are, are meeting. Um, but I think, I mean, most of these inter intergenerational problems are by definition international problems as well. So I think that um, um, international cooperation between parliaments, exchanging best practices and so on is really interesting. And I think it's, it's important. And I think that um, the IPU, um, the OECD and so on have a really good role to play in, in accelerating and um, um, uh, these discussions and in bringing together different, um, um, different actors that might be struggling with very similar or very different issues. Um, so I think more is needed, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to hearing what else is going on. Yeah, I always think that the more you share, actually, the more you learn. And it tends to be the case also, particularly with, with uh, difficult problems that you're facing and all parliaments, all societies will be dealing with this. So the more you share and have uh, common events, to bring people together to discuss issues, the more then you can advance in solutions. Um, there's a really interesting comment by Omoyawa, who is in South Africa at the moment, um, about the creation of a youth parliamentarian forum, which is set up across a number of African national parliaments, and they work like a, a youth caucus group within parliament to give way to the voice of youth MPs across parliament. Um, and how in, in Nigeria, the, this forum is currently being integrated to subnational parliaments. So again, another idea there for the, for the generation uh, for the overlapping generation, I guess, in terms of, of, of young people. Now, we also had plans, Izzy and Dan, and as myself, had plans to talk about uh, deliberative democracy, the role of deliberative democracy, um, and climate, um, sorry, citizens' assemblies to, to help with thinking about future generations. Um, I'll, Didier, are you able to say one minute something about that? Because I know there's a lot of curiosity about the literature democracy, and so it's a good way of thinking of these issues. And then I'll finish off the seminar. Yeah, one minute to uh, to summarize my entire career. That's uh, going to be a challenge. Um, in any event, um, I think in recent years we have seen that there is an increasing um, interest in in deliberate mini public. So um, groups of randomly selected citizens that discuss long-term issues that come up with uh, recommendations and so on uh, that formulate policies um, so there is a growing experience with that um, and i can tell from my own research that these types of, of mini publics they actually have a huge impact not just on um, on individual participants but also on policies that are made um, first of all we found that people become more long-termists. There is a, a stronger support through deliberation for uh, long-term policies, even if they cost money in the short term for benefits that are potentially there in the long term. Um, what we found is that some cognitive biases, some myopic biases, myopic voter biases and so on are corrected, um, and that people through deliberation become increasingly aware of the fact that they are just one generation in, a, in an entire cycle of future genera of, of generations. So they can locate themselves in, let's say, the transgenerational continuum. They realize that they are at one point were a future generation, that they should think about future generations. However, one of the things that is a major issue with these climate uh, assemblies and with these deliberative mini publics on, on long term issues, and that is political uptake. Usually these climate assemblies and so on, they take place in a, in a relatively, let's say, political vacuum. They're disconnected from formal politics, they're disconnected from parliaments and so on, from formal decision making. So their recommendations do not make it to the policy cycle and they do not make it through the, 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 the formal decision making procedure. So I think that is where the, the, the biggest challenge lies. And some parliaments have tried to incorporate mini publics um, and to institutionalize these mini publics uh, in order to ensure that there is increasing take up. I think in many countries, um, attempts have been made, especially in Belgium. I might be completely biased as a Belgian, but we, um, we are the avant garde apparently um, when I speak to international colleagues in terms of, uh, uh, of these, uh, these mini public, institutionalized mini publics. Um, so, if there are any questions, I'm, I, I would be very happy to um, uh, to linger after the uh, after the meeting. But yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Didier. So, um, 
climate assemblies or citizen assemblies deliberative very good way of thinking of thinking of the longer term the wider perspective and there are quite a few examples now of parliaments actually using these tools and we have had already seminars here in ipen ipu seminars on this topic and we're going to have another one actually probably in June on deliberative democracy, how's that being used in Australia and, and maybe Germany as host Sven is somewhere in the call and if that could also be included in that. Um, but before I ask everyone to thank uh, our speakers, I just want to announce our next seminar. And if Fiona or someone else from the team, if they could put the link to the next seminar so that people can register if they're interested on the chat, that would be hugely appreciated. Our next seminar will be on the 18th of April at 9 a.m. UK time, so that's 10 a.m. Central European time. And it's going to be about mass input from citizens to parliamentary procedures. So in a context where your parliaments are opening up to ask for uh, input from citizens, but then what, they, what, how to process all of that into actually policy, policy decision making. And we'll have two seminars on that, one of, in Brazil in May, but the one in April will be based in New Zealand and Scotland case studies. It should be really, really interesting. I hope to see many of you at that seminar. Um, and the link is in the chat now. Thanks very much, Fiona and Temitayo. Uh, Temitayo has actually put the one for Brazil also. So you've got both, both seminars there uh, on the chat if you want to see how to register. And, and for these, they are part of this, this uh, public engagement hub, so you do need to register for it and it will be taken on Zoom. So in terms of thank yous, thank you very much for everyone who's attended, We've had really excellent attendance. Thank you for all of those who are brave enough to keep your cameras on. It's lovely to see your faces. Uh, thank you for the questions and comments. Uh, super thanks to our interpreters who make a, a, a massive, important job in terms of translating or fast talking into different languages. And of course, our main thanks to Didi and Dan, who are absolutely brilliant in explaining very complex concepts in the face in a very clear way and, and bringing us those examples. So can you please join me in showing your appreciation for uh, Dan and Didier in particular, either with real clapping or fake clapping or virtual clapping or however you want to do it and I'll do it both. Thank you very much and apologies we want two minutes late but if anyone wants to stay around to ask any questions I'm sure Dan and Didier would be very happy. Um, and I definitely want to say proper thank you to you, Didier and Dan, so don't run away straight away. But otherwise, have a lovely day, lovely evening, wherever you are, and we'll hope to see you again. Bye-bye.